We are the Org. Our mission is to assimilate Star Trek The Next Generation, Star Trek Deep Space Nine, and beer. Lots of beer. Hello, friends! Hello! Welcome to Borkhouse 716! The ship one. <laughs> oh dear. Oh, that, that's really selling the episode. Well done. <laughs> Sorry. The cast isn't necessarily shit, but the episodes aren't good. Wow. They're showing your hand straight away. <laughs> Why is that a problem? If people have watched these episodes... Yeah, they've got some they, idea. They, they haven't just got some idea. Mm. They know. <laughs> oh dear. Okay, well, first of all, we better do... Last time on Star Trek The Next Generation. Or in this case, last time but one on Star Trek The Next Generation. Daria's catching up with the podcast. Oh, right. And he says, listening right now, and just had a quick thought about Dr. Mora's utterance over poor Odo in the alternate, broadcast 713. Maybe they have more than one religion on Bajor. We've got loads here on Earth. Maybe as popular as prophetism is, there are others. Which one is monotheistic and followed by Dr. Mora? Next, I'll hear your Sub Rosa review. I feel your pain. <laughs> <laughs> it's a nice episode. It's not as bad as Sub Rosa, at least. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Mm, okay. <laughs> yes, I mean, it, 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 we never hear other than um, there is another r- r- religion we find out later on, but it's a more sort of flip side of the prophets sort of thing. Yeah. But so we don't hear of any other religion, so. Hmm. Unless it's a bit like the Russian Orthodox. Bear with me on this one, I know that sounds odd, but, but it does make sense-ish. The Russian Orthodox, for a very, very long time, was so much the dominant religion when communism first fell, that if you wanted to be another religion, you had to get a licence, and I think that to an extent it's still true, although perhaps not as bad as it was. So the only religions, really, that people knew about in Russia was Orthodox Christianity. Most people didn't know that there were Muslims in Russia, as distinct from Muslims in bits that used to be part of the USSR mm-hmm. or other Christian denominations beside the Orthodox. So maybe in ba- on Bajor, prophetism, whatever you want to call it, is like the Orthodox and they are very much the dominant religion and they don't, they aren't good at tolerating other religions so you don't hear about them. Mm-hmm. But maybe you can be a member and don't wear an earring and then you only have one God. All oh, right, interesting thought. Well, That's also, probably far more in depth than the makers of DS9 yeah, ever probably, imagined. I isn't suspect. It? <laughs> we also heard from Doreen on the Twitters. She didn't think that Molly was told about her father. We said that uh, Jake wasn't told. Yeah. She reckons that Molly wasn't either, and her reaction to Miles is more due to her being a toddler and also Keiko's daughter. Yeah, that makes sense. Possibly. Yeah, that, that, I think also because actually Molly's what about three or four. I think actually they probably wouldn't have told her because what, mm, what level what would her understanding would that be? Make, yeah, yeah maybe, so maybe. actually she probably is just picking it up. Mm. Pori and Ravine continued the discussion on Troy's promotion from uh, Thy Known Self in our last podcast, and that's on the forum. So do have a look at that. Interesting stuff. And Amy on the Twitters reckons we need an extra beer for masks. Yeah, she went wrong. No, she won't. <laughs> Well, let's let's find out what we think of masks. A strange ancient civilization. It is over 87 million years old. Takes possession of data. What does it feel like when a person is losing his mind? Now he's become a terrifying force. She's going to hurt us all. That's planning a complete takeover of the Enterprise. I'm not going to permit this ship to be turned into an alien city. And Picard knows only one way to stop him. Death. Next time on Star Trek The Next Generation. That's an interesting trailer that tries to make out it's all about Data versus the ship, which yeah. is a far saner plot than the one we got. <laughs> yeah. So, short version. The writers of Next Generation try to recapture the inner light and fail dismally. The principle <laughs> is it's a, it's a dying civilization. Something's gone wrong with their moon and they send off this big probe. And instead of it being like Picard living a life and we see that life within the civilization, instead Data ends up with mul- multiple personalities because he ends up with the si- entire civilization inside his head. The way to solve the problem is to bring the moon in inverted commas back, but that's why the civilization died. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you for that. That made a lot more sense than the episode did, certainly. 
<laughs> is there anything else you want me to touch on other than that? Because the episode was shit. Uh, okay, do you want me to talk about it then? No, I just mean, is there anything worth saying? Well, that's no. I suppose there is in that the way that it takes over the Enterprise is interesting, if odd. Mm-hmm. It's, um, it has a transformation program and it takes what the Enterprise already has and changes it so that you end up with undergrowth everywhere and strange artifacts appearing and when daisy gets taken over he has this symbol appear on his forehead and then he has like a chest plate but it changes color and design on the chest plate according to which particular personality is dominant at that time yes presumably this is being done by the replicators somehow but it's very odd well they talk about it taking over the replicators don't they Mm -hmm. but it's taking over other systems as well yes you end up with lots of undergrowth at one point the observation is it the observation house where they go and talk in the outer table of Ouchies? Yep. That's a swamp. <laughs> There's a point in engineering where they're trying to do stuff, Geordie and Wharf, and they have to um, have an emergency beam out because not only is there undergrowth, but there's now a fire. You have this very bizarre conversation about a third of the way through. But they talk about the fact that it's starting to take over the ship. They're beginning to get concerned. But Picard is like, you know, if this is an information archive, I want to know what it's got. Because, you know, it's bringing out the archaeologist in him, isn't it? Mm-hmm. So they're they're saying all that, but they are getting a bit worried. So it's like, you know, you need to monitor it or whatever. And then they turn around and they say, you know, what systems do we have? And one of the ones that Wolf mentions is comms, but they don't actually try and contact anyone. That doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. So, oh yeah, there's there's a scene very early on with Crusher and Troy where the artifact first appears in Troy's room. And you get, oh, is this from Riker? And it's like, no, it's not really real style. Oh, have you got a secret admirer? No. And they don't even mention Worf. No, that whole thing about, what, four or five stories ago about in parallels, about him having a champagne dinner with Troy, that actually doesn't lead anywhere for ages, does it? Blimey. And we're running out of season seven for anything to go anywhere at this point. But yes, there's no suggestion that might have been left behind by Worf as a prezi. So, bizarre. Yeah. As everybody knows, I don't ship Wolf and Troy at all. But in terms of the continuity, it makes no sense that he would even get mentioned. Mm. Well, he wouldn't get mentioned, yes. Yeah, that's what I mean. Sorry. I'm, I'm, I had beer quite quickly because this episode was terrible. <laughs> okay, I did, Like I said, I did actually make copious notes while I was trying to work out what was going on. I remember the sun moon thing. Then I worked out what was going on and then I stopped. <laughs> is there anything I need to say? Oh, yes. The baddie is Moussaka, so they're all obsessed with Greek dish involving aubergine. Yep, apparently. We have the return of Eric from Liaisons, the completely forgettable character, the kind of Wesley Mark II. Oh, what did he do then? He was the kid at the start. Oh, yes. Yeah. He is okay. completely forgettable, isn't he? Yes, he is. And not a great actor either, as he proves in this. No. Troy seems to be some sort of in some sort of teaching role at this point, doing an art class, which is a bit bizarre. But, hey, anybody can teach on the Enterprise. Well, yeah, in, in Starfleet, even. Yeah. Bizarre that Data is doing the lessons and learning, supposedly learning about creativity. Hang on a minute. Wasn't he doing, like, really complicated modern art like, yeah. a season ago? And suddenly he's regressed to the point where he can't do any sort of expressionism at all oh, very know. odd very strange the comet that we see is pretty impressive yeah it looks quite nice that's created by the same people who did the comets at the beginning of the credits of deep space nine yeah i think the other thing that i would the other two things i'd make mention is that at one point data grabs picard's wrist and if data was just a human it would just be a wrist grab but picard's like because ah! obviously it's data and he's probably broken his wrist at that point and then I think the other thing that I would want to mention is the characters in inverted commas played badly by Brent Spiner. <laughs> oh yeah, oh man. It's, it's another Brent Spiner acting masterclass. Oh. Now to, to be fair, he wasn't feeling particularly prepared for this because obviously he featured quite heavily in the previous story, Thine Own Self, and then, and then he had zero time to prepare for this story in which he features quite prominently again playing multiple characters which he does so well... Oh, he does dear. like a really bad Marlon Brando he, I was going to say exactly the same thing At one point he's channeling Marlon Brando Isn't he? Yeah Oh crapola Well the thing is This makes as much sense as the end of Apocalypse Now it, it? Yes Yeah the, the horror You can the horror Oh don't <laughs> And it's like you know Picard's a student of archaeology Why did it take him so pissing long To get the sun moon connection? That was That's the one bit that's really obvious That they spend ages realising, isn't it? Oh, it's, it's like, it, it, it's not quite as bad as, as as last time data remembering everything except what radioactive means. Yeah. Mm. But it's on a par. He'd guessed that much, much sooner. 
bearing in mind that the, the the whole thing is solved in the end by him playing the role of the moon Corgano and g- using what he knows of archaeology so that you know and they have him pick him up a blatantly polystyrene prop that doesn't have a good <laughs> sound effect to be put down again either yeah. it's a bit reminiscent of a blue jelly baby actually but you know they they they've brought in they've drawn on his archaeology so it makes it even worse that he's that stupid that he yep. doesn't pick it up that soon so Basically, they all get obsessed with Greek food. <laughs> there was originally going to be a funny scene, uh, one of the really? deleted scenes that's quite good. Oh, we saw it. Oh, that with one, With Riker, yes. Worf and Geordie getting odd snacks and drinks at 10 forward and Worf liking it. Yes, and which it is turns nicely acted. blood, which sort of... Ooh, does it? All right, okay. Yeah, yeah. because Worf says, I like it, and then it turns out to be blood. And he's like, oh, he would do, but Worf tries to spit it back in his glass again. There's a shade of not. You've already touched on the fact that this draws very heavily from the, the inner light. The inner light. Uh, there are also shades here of contagion as the Enterprise computer is taken over yet again. Oh. No firewall again. And data. <sighs> and data yet again. This is why they can't promote data, guys. All right. You were asking last time. It's because it's a complete liability. This is the umpteenth time he's posed a real danger to the ship. Plus, he has to go to a primary school and have lessons in clay. Yeah. <laughs> There's a cool effect where they uh, they melt the comet. Yeah. Which, for the time, was really well achieved. The a- actual archive thing that then they fore out, on the DVD, didn't look good at all. On the Blu-ray, actually, wasn't too bad. Yeah. I think they've added an extra level of definition to it, a level of detail to, yeah. the, to the blue, because all the effects have been redone. So it looks a lot better on the Blu-ray, believe me. I mean, to begin with, it's sort of a nice mystery building, but it just, it just, it's... g and Oh, very much so, isn't it? All the massacre is waking stuff, and oh. oh and it relies so heavily on Brent Spiner's performance. This and is never a good idea. No, no, not a good idea at all. There's a very, very long scene about, what, two-thirds of the way in of Data and Picard, oh. with Brent Spiner doing all the different characters, and they're just hunched in a room, and it feels oh. like it goes on forever. And you've got Pan Pipe set to maximum warp as well, which doesn't oh, help. Oh, yeah. And the thing is, when he starts going on in that extended scene about all the things that Masaka does that are blatantly linked to being the sun, <laughs> and Picard doesn't pick it up, it just makes me want to slap his bald head. <laughs> How very do you. <sighs> and then where they get that photon torpedo... And uh, it's it's got loads of snakes in it. That yeah. uh, I went to a Samuel L. Jackson place at that point where motherfucking snakes and my motherfucking photon torpedo. <laughs> <laughs> Don't think iTunes would accept that as the episode title. No, no, we can't do it. We could do snakes on a torpedo, I suppose, but that's not quite as fun, is it? And the temple set that we see, which is not very well realised, it has no, to be said. It clearly isn't made chair. of stone. It isn't made of stone. Chair Napolestyrene. Uh, that'll return in Deep Space Nine. I hope they've worked on it a bit so it looks better. Data just walks out of his room when he's already. they already know he's been taken over. They don't lock the door or anything. Stupid. And they only put two guards outside, which yeah. he really easily takes out with his palm. Just... <sighs> and at the end, we discover this is the second episode in a row when Data suffers from memory loss because he can't remember any of this oh. story either. So his logs are going to be very empty, aren't they? <laughs> yeah. Day 64. No, I still don't remember anything that happened today. Um. <laughs> Dear Dr. Maddox, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I can't forget. I can't remember anything. Oh. <sighs> I don't know if this would have been any better, but originally this was going to be a version of The Tempest. What? D- we, yeah, I know. For some reason, Data would be acting as Ariel to Picard's Prospero. Right. But that got lost in the rewrites. But then again, why would an alien pro be recreating... Shakespeare. Yeah. Many of the writing staff were displeased with the finished episode. All of them Funny should have that. been. Whoever wasn't needs to be shot. Particularly the unsatisfying last act. Oh. <sighs> I am the sun and you <laughs> are the moon. Oh. You know what's better than this episode? You know in the Big She's Lebowski... She's to the balls. <laughs> I wasn't going to suggest that. I was going to say, you know in the Big Lebowski where they have to go and watch the landlord do his stupid fucking dance thing on a chair? Yeah, his interpretation of the ring cycle. Yeah. yeah that's better than this episode. <laughs> so there you are. It's a bit of a disjointed review of this episode. Normally we go through the plot a little more logically there's than this. There's no but, point. But there's no point with this one. And to be honest, it's fairly faithful to the episode to approach it like this. I can't help feeling it. Yes, it's just a pile of wank. I um I posted a picture on Twitter of uh, of Picard wearing that mask, uh-huh. which makes him look like an utter prawn, and got some interesting responses. 
Dave Scott, Lonely God on Twitter. Picard's low budget Ninja Turtle cosplay. <laughs> <laughs> a colleague of mine in the diocese. Looks like the Face Guards England hockey women team wore on Sunday for penalty corners. Awesome gold medal win. Oh dear. He's got sport on the brain as, as Reverend Andrew. Daz Watford. Caught up with the broadcast today. Couldn't help smiling when you said you were doing this one next. Yeah, we weren't smiling for long. No. <laughs> uh, our friend Darren from the Black Dog. Just have half a pack of Dextrose tablets and a can of full fat Coke. Same effect as watching masks. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Zombie Kudos, is it some sort of futuristic face mask? Will it clear blackheads and give Picard perfect eyebrows and a wrinkle-free forehead? Well, that makes as much sense as anything yeah. in the episode, to be honest. <sighs> well, we've got that over. Yes. Let's, let's find out what others think of this one. Yes. We heard from the Mark on the forum. Masks, or I don't know what you did, sir, but it looks like everything's back to normal. Or the inner light's evil twin. Yeah. Intellectually speaking, I prefer the ambitious failure that is masked to some other episodes. Masks might be the most flat-out bizarre episode of Next Generation ever made. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're not wrong there. It's conceptually ambitious, but ultimately an epic failure of an episode. I mean, this is an utter mess. The story is at times so impenetrable and incoherent as to require absinthe to adequately convey its bewildering effect. Oh, gosh. But at least they tried with it. I have to say that I laughed when I got to Queen Masaka's name, as Masaka, an expression in Japanese that indicates shock or disbelief at something. All oh, right. It wasn't Greek food, then. <laughs> I was staring blankly at the screen in disbelief, as pretentious as it is near impossible to decipher. Now, could I go back and watch, listen more closely, and to figure out what this episode is trying to say? I suppose I could try, but I'm not sure I want to. Mm. <laughs> yeah, with you on that, yeah. Let's look at Joe Minoski's roll core of incomprehensible, impenetrable, incoherent, and just plain bad episode. Darmok. Oof. Masks. Emergence. I think that's the really w whacked out holodeck one. And Deep whacked out holodeck? What's that one? We haven't had that one yet. Okay. And Deep Space Nine's Dramatis Personae. Oh. Yes. This is very similar to that one, isn't it? Yes. Culture's being played out with... Oh, oh my life. He gets... Better later and becomes the best of the bunch on Voyager. Not saying much. No. The hokey payoff at the end of this second-rate dramatis personae with Picard and Data facing off in their titular masks owes more to a trick-or-treating and cosplay than ancient mythology. Yep. And yet as goofy as this is, the story manages, plays itself deadly serious. As long as the computerised archive gods are happy with Picard's performance while wearing a mask, all is well in the world. Mm. It's a bottle show with the cheapest props. They had, say, a CGI battle between two transformed gods. That might have been different. Hmm. For example, it would have been more than what we had. The word you're looking for, Joe, is symbolism. Watch Boondock Saints and William Defoe will explain it. I have no idea what that's a reference to, but there we are. In Good Trek episodes, the characters solve a problem, and in doing so reveal something about the human condition, or at least about themselves. When there's no problem to solve, you're going away from the formula, which means the episode is going to be unusual, either in a good way, or a bad way. To me, this episode is like Inner Light's Evil Twin. In both cases, you have an ancient evil alien society that has left a cultural archive which the Enterprise happens to discover. Neither episode has a real problem to solve. Everyone is basically just waiting for the magic alien gadget to finish. I think that's quite right, because mm. in, in Inner Light, you've got a real peril for Picard. He may yeah. potentially die. I don't know how that's going to turn out. In this one, theoretically, the whole ship's at risk of being turned into weird... Aztec looking shit mm. but it, it obviously doesn't involve you in quite as good a way <laughs> and we don't really learn much about the alien culture we only see it in such disconnected pieces that it's hard to get much of a feel for it and we don't really get to know any individual characters either certainly not to the level that we got to know the ancient Katanans very true mm. we only really learn about one myth I'm not even sure if any of the various personalities here are supposed to be real or if they're all myth mythological you may also compare this episode to Darmok, because both of them are basically an incomprehensible model till the crew manages to piece together the outlines of an alien myth. I think the difference, again, comes down to characters. Darmok has them, and even without real communication, you learn about the Temerian captain and what their society considers important. This, however, does not have characters. It has bodies. Yeah. It has Brent Spiner. Yes. Ooh. Intriguing, but lacking the budget of script to pull it off with half the talent in the writing pool simply due to it, the 18 writers giving additional attention to Deep Space Nine, while other staff were starting thinking about the forthcoming Next Generation film and early planning on Voyager. Mm. Yeah, I think, that's the, I think the cause of why this is shit, he's, he's got that right. We've also heard from Purry. 
Hello Args, Parry here to talk about masks. Um, remember how I have mentioned in quite a few feedbacks that uh, with Season 7 being the bottom of the barrel scraping, uh, we got some batshit crazy stuff. Well, I was talking about masks. Um, yes, this is where they remade the old 1980s TV show and to defeat rogue Admiral Miles Mayhem, uh, Picard and his crew have to don uh, weird, oddly powered masks and fly shuttlecrafts that sprout uh, weird and uh, frankly improbable weapons. That's not the plot of this, but that would make just as much sense. No, in masks, instead, we have um, the crew finding some sort of uh, archive which initially takes over the replicator, starts replicating uh, polystyrene tribal art. It is polystyrene. Look at it when Picard lifts it up. He doesn't give it any sense of weight. And uh, takes over data so that uh, Brent Spiner can exercise his acting chops a little, including doing sort of a impish uh, joke prankster, because we love Brent Spiner's impish prankster. Every time he does emotions, we get an impish prankster. Uh, to, and uh, eventually takes over the whole ship and starts turning it into some sort of weird uh, temple. And Picard has to beat it using archaeology. Yeah, I think if you put that into a season 4 script meeting, you'd have been laughed out of the room. But by season 7, no one was really watching, so this sort of thing got sent through. Um, and yeah, it's... I mean, it's definitely interesting. Uh, I wouldn't quite call it entertaining, but, uh, you know, you're sitting there going, what the hell is going on? It's, uh, I mean, I could go into sort of my real nerdy stuff on technology just seems to do stuff because it does. So initially the replicators can not only replicate things, but uh, pleasantly place them on shelves. Uh, I didn't realise that. I thought if a replicator had replicated a statue, it would uh, just sit in the replicator. But uh, there you go. And then later on, it can turn component parts of the ship by rearranging molecules. Okay, we've seen sci fi tech, that's fair enough. But what was it turning into the plants? Was that the crew? Was it the plants in the Arboretum? Was it like dust and flakes of skin lying around? Would there have been fewer plants if the Enterprise crew hoovered once in a while? And yeah, it's just, like I say, I always thought that Brent Spiner brought a certain sense of subtlety to data. There was an underlying hint of emotion in the performance at times. Or at least there was something else there which I thought was uh, powerfully imbued, but Every so often he does things like this, where you just wonder, is he is he doing his wee sizzle reel? Is he thinking the series is ending and he's not sure the movies are going to take off and he wants to make sure he's got all his acting abilities in one convenient episode because he does his impish prankster, his uh, his crotchety old man, uh, oh, and, and you know, his um, sun god. I did like, actually, Picard beating it with archaeology. I quite liked the idea of him going through and understanding stuff rather than, you know, just letting Worf phaser the uh, the archive. Uh, you know, oh, it's an ancient repository of information, but it's threatening the ship, so blow that thing up. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I did quite like that. And I even liked some of the symbols they'd made up. I thought they actually did quite a good job of doing that. Uh, but it's just the episode is so damn weird. And um, this is a sci-fi show which has had the Enterprise suckled by a giant space cow. Um, you know, it's well, more of a slug thing, really, but I, I took cow from it. I thought it was quite bovine. Uh, and But it is it's just really bizarre. And the ship reconfiguring itself to have huge temples in it with, with apparently outdoors. It's, I think, if they'd maybe had all the weird stuff appearing in maybe a holodeck program, uh, that might have worked a bit better. You know, I mean, okay, Miss Lake would have been another holodeck going wrong episode, but at least it would give us something. But then that would probably be too much like an episode we're going to see in probably a few weeks' time called Emergence. Uh, and so maybe they said, no, we'll just have, it, just have it reconfigure the ship, just have members of the crew apparently find that their rooms suddenly turn into uh, temples or rainforests or swamps. Uh, that's fine. Um, and I think that's where it is. It's, like I say, I'd, I'd be hard-pressed to call it crap. It's just utterly bonkers. And, I mean, yeah, it's not really one you'd hunt out. Also, there is the problem that having the baddie called Moussaka, um, I'm automatically thinking of uh, food. So, you know, I am Moussaka. I am Couscous. I am Rogan Josh. Uh, that's what, it, And as a result, I, I did in my head nickname everyone after um, vaguely exotic sounding foods. Although, let's face it, nowadays in Britain, Couscous and Rogan Josh aren't exactly exotic. So, yeah, it's... I mean, it probably is a bad episode, but I think it blindsides you with the utter weirdness of it. Um, oh, also, Troy gets promotion to commander, and what's her first uh, job? Um, art teacher. Yay, promotion. Uh, but anyway, I'll be back shortly to talk about Paradise. Uh, until then, bye for now. Bye. <laughs> bye. 
I am Rogan Josh. Maybe yes. the episode title. <laughs> yes. Uh, interesting but not entertaining is a generous look at it, the et- episode, yes. Mm. I, the only You can only assume the way that things were appearing in odd places around the ship, thanks to replicators, that they somehow interfaced with the transporters as well. And the two systems are quite closely related, and hence it's transporting replicated stuff in different places on the ship. I don't know. It makes as much sense as anything else in this episode, doesn't it? Yeah. I, I do like your idea that this episode is Brent Spiner's showreel. Yeah, well, I think it's fair to say that he's great at playing Data, but less, I've not seen him play any other role I've been impressed with. Um, the, the one that springs to mind is his Mad Professor in Independence Day, which again is, is fairly sort of that same role all over again, isn't it? Yeah. He either does emotionless or all the emotion crazy. Yeah. Mm. He's no Nick Cage, that's for certain. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. I agree that... Um, Having this as a holiday programme gone wrong would have made more sense, but I can also understand why... The, the big writers, groans if they'd gone yeah, down that route. Yeah, but it would have made more but, sense. I mean, this really is highlighted the fact that the bottom of barrel is scraping so loudly the writers are going deaf. I mean, yeah. it's just... What what can we? It's what else can we do? It's making horrible screechy noises that make you want oh, to cover your ears, isn't it's it? terrible. Just terrible. <sighs> I think they scraped the bottom of the barrel and found a dead rat. <laughs> Let's see what Drew and Tracy made of this one. So it's not often that I do moan about a Next Generation episode, but... You moan about them every time. Dear fucking Halloumi, that was shit. <laughs> you know what? I don't think it was bad. Oh, it was. Sub Rosa was pretty terrible. No, this... No, hold on, hold on. Sub Rosa was bad. We just watched bad episodes. This wasn't bad. Oh. There was nothing bad about it. It's just like no interest this episode. This just bored me to tears. I know, that's the thing. It wasn't terrible. It was just like absolutely yeah. zero commitment to absolutely. watching it. Absolutely. So the first bit I, was I tell like... you what, I'm in serious now. This is the first episode that I was nearly like, you know what, should we just turn it yeah, off? Yeah, you were really. I, I got was... up to go for Widgel uh, and you was like, do you really want to watch the end? I was you know, like, yeah. that's not like yeah. you. So in this one, data is channeled by what is the meteor, the light, and then it turns yeah. out to be some kind of spirit. So for about five minutes, it freaked me out, and I was almost buried I in there because I when thought, when "Oh my god, t- this is like the Exorcist! This is really freaking me out!" And he turned around, and he's like, "Really?" And he had that face. Weird and looking. You nearly jumped into a tree. I did because it really freaked the life out of me. That was a one exciting bit of the. It of the was episode. the only exciting bit of the mm. episode. You know, if they hadn't been around, what would have happened in this episode? Absolute fuck. It, all. Let's just say the Romulans had come across that oh, thing. It might have been a bit better. Yeah, they would have probably just like self-destructed the ship when it started. Well, exactly. They would have tried to fight. It, you know, they're doing yeah. a Picard in this one. They're talking, oh, let's be peace and love, but and let's be friends been around with it. and got all them personalities and been involved mm. in it all. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, so the alien ship looked like Jenga in space. It did I look mean, like what Jenga. was all that about? And you know, the point of having a ship that was so intricate when I... you looked at it from afar and then you never were actually on the ship. What the point is that? It, oh, it was just a waste way. of time. So to me, the Enterprise looked like it was turning into either a the Crystal Maze. Yeah, the Aztec zone. <laughs> it was, you wasn't did it? Say He's just switching Richard O'Brien. It okay, was, it's, a men- it's a mental game. Two minutes and it's always Absolutely. Lucky. Like I was saying, Geordie and Wolf need to get out. They're going to get locked in. <laughs> exactly. So it was either Crystal Mace or Jumanji. You know, when yeah. all the leaves were coming out, it was like, this ship is turning into Jumanji. You're going to have bleeding chimpanzees running monkeys, across in a minute. Yes. yes. Was that not the take that symbol that Data had tattooed on his head? It was the T and the T. I don't know. I don't know what it looks like. So they kept all bloody saying Masaka throughout this. I'm now starving, them, you know. Uh-huh. Stop saying Masaka. But then, at the end of it, Data comes out with his little mask on. He looks like Lady Gaga when she did a, a raw meat section, with didn't the, she? With, like, bits of bacon on yeah, his face. Yeah, he did yeah. look like that, yeah. Crispy bacon. Yeah, this episode, it, it was awful, wasn't it? I mean, this, the soundtrack had loads of pan pipes in oh, it, didn't geez. it? And I think that's that's very much telling of the whole episode, doesn't it? It's a pan pipes episode. Oh. It's just really bland rubbish. This was a bland O'Carrison. Okay, and I get into trouble for saying it all the time, but it was it bland. It was bland O'Carrison. Okay, I'll even let you say the, it this time. Even the beginning where Data was doing his sculpture... And yes. Troy was what? Why, what what why, was that about? Why were they all in uniform? Why is she there with her rank and like date is in a, a clay um, class, whatever you want to call yeah, it? And an imagination all in, class. And all in uniform. What? That's just ridiculous, isn't it? Well, they just look stupid. No, but I did wonder about this. But she's actually 
doing her duties, isn't she? She's performing, so she, she has to be... She teaches children now. Yeah, but she has to be in uniform. But no. Data did No, no, you don't want command staff. You have to be in uniform. I mean, you know what... There what is if... no section where Troy ever commands staff, so no, just let her wear a blue, She right? did a commander... Uh, clean last one didn't she all right but the alternative is that she wears her slippers and she's got her tits out so what do you want when you're teaching kids no but hold on so so if like one of them's on lifeguard duty would they have their (laughs) like their uniform on or or you know like in there is no swimming pool on the enterprise i bet there is or they're like (laughs) digging up like in the organics bay whatever you call it they're where the uniform there that picard goes oh i'll just do like half hour half hour in the allotment (laughs) facility (laughs) and he's in his uniform no no, I'm sorry, this episode was rubbish. I'll tell you what. I, I think this is, you know what, worst episode <laughs> so far of... An episode of season Picard seven. picking out his onions in the allotment would have been better than it this. It would have been, it. yes. Okay, <laughs> leave it there then. There is absolutely nothing more I can say about this. Okay. Jerry Bank Holiday, let's leave it there. Thank Bye. you. Bye. 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 <laughs> I love that you're starving because of all the masaka. <laughs> <laughs> Jenga in space. Yes. And I love the Crystal Maze references. Yes. This would have been so much better as, as a Crystal Maze episode. Yeah. What, no, what you need to do is have the, the episode as it is, okay, but you just have Richard O'Brien there commenting. The Come entire... on, work it out. <laughs> yeah. Then you could play a little piano tune and talk about his mumsy. Yeah. Actually, I think Brent Spiner was channeling Richard O'Brien slightly, wasn't he? But there we are. Oh, yeah. They were <sighs> just stuck in the Aztec zone and they were too shit to work their way out and got locked in. I mean, I think it's fair to say that at least bad episodes have a certain fascination. I mean, Sub- I, I revised my opinion, actually. This is worse than Sub Rosa. Oh, yeah. Because so Sub Rosa was. was entertainingly bad in places. This is just, yeah, you're right, because it doesn't make much sense. It's just dull. And yeah. that, I say, particularly that long scene with Picard and Data. Oh, no. oh, it was ripping me eyeballs out with that one, having to sit through it again. Oh. Yeah. Oh. I mean, this one's less offensive. Yes. To the Scottish people in particular. Although I expect there's some plenty of Aztecs out there. If they hadn't all been wiped out, I'd be very cross about this episode. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I don't oh. Know. Yeah. It's, <laughs> oh. it, it is terrible. But oh, the discussion about why they're in uniform. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's so true though. You pottery in your uniform. You know, mm. Why is Data in his uniform? But then does he have civvies even? Oh. And then it's like, with Troy, well, you've got two choices, haven't you? You've got the, the command uniform or get her tits out. She's mm. in front of the kids, so she's got a command uniform Well, this on. just reminded me of the pottery teacher in our school, who also happened to be our form tutor, who wore these really low-cut shirts. Oh, my. And when she leaned over to do the register, you, you could just hear the hormones popping. It was uh-huh. incredible. <laughs> was it a bit ghost? Uh, I've never seen ghost, but I mean, she was a dance like more attractive than Demi. Is Demi Moore, isn't it, Ghost? Oh, I can't remember. Now. Yeah, Patrick mm. Swayze. Okay, well, ordinarily we'd say, okay, well, you know, bad next gen episode, season seven. What a surprise! But at least we can rely on Deep Space Nine to save us. This can is, we this week? Uh, can no, we? No, this is remember Brandy's worst episode ever. Yeah. Okay, let's prepare ourselves then for Paradise. Uh, just give us an excuse to play this. Brian are captured by a strange cult. Put your hands up. Ruled by an obsessed leader. Sometimes fate delivers us exactly where we need to be. Now, with no way to escape, I get the distinct impression she expects us to be here for a while. They must join. You'll have to do things our way. Or perish. You are willing to let them die for your theories. On the next episode of Star Trek Deep Space Nine. So no messing around with that trailer, really. Straight to the beef. But when is a cult leader not obsessed? <laughs> well, indeed. It kind of comes to the territory, doesn't it? does a it? bit, yeah. Federation are looking at setting up colonies near the wormhole, and so Cisco and O'Brien are on a scouting mission on the Rio Grande. Commander wants Jake to do an apprenticeship with the Chief. Miles makes reference to what he learned on the front line of Setleg 3, which is a nice callback, mm. and landing him up in the gold suit rather than the red that he started Next Generation in. And it's kind of two dads having a chat about kids, basically, which yeah. is quite nice. Oh, it's interesting that he, you you know just from like later episodes, but don't worry, I'm not going to section 31 here, that he hasn't actually asked Jake 
what he wants. Yeah. He just assumes Jake wants to go into Starfleet. Mm-hmm. Doesn't think that, for example, he might want to be a chef like his granddad, which comes up later. Yeah. Doesn't ask him. We well, don't know at the moment. Maybe this is what Jake thinks he wants at the moment. I'll leave it I at suppose. That. But yeah. it just... It hmm. should be Jake asking somebody... Yeah. Considering you already know he gets on well with O'Brien, yes, yeah. that would make more sense. But yeah. obviously, we... that, that, I mean, it just riled me slightly. Yeah. Not O'Brien, but and not not the acting, nothing like that. But Cisco as a character, it yeah. riled me a bit. They find a suitable planet, but there are already human life forms there. It's no response to hail, so they beam down to a forested area, only to find that all their equipment has gone dead due to a duonetic field. And they're apprehended by a pair of dudes with a bow. Which unfortunately teaser. made me think of the, I am not a merry man and that horrible <laughs> Cupid. Robin Hood episode. <laughs> yes, no, this is not Cupid by a long way. No. But the thing is, the whole cult thing just makes me think of Drive Angry and I just <laughs> wish I was watching that again. <laughs> One of the men recognises the Starfleet uniforms, or at least an older version, and introduces himself as Joseph. Chat with a bow is Vinod, which is, yes, that's a name. Apparently, they're It's co- wine with a D on the end. It is, yes. Apparently their colony was due to settle elsewhere, but their ship developed problems, and they ended up on this planet with none of their equipment working. Despite this, they've made a home here. We see a village formed out of a transport ship, the SS Santa Maria, which is a brilliant set. Absolutely excellent stuff there, well done. We meet the leader of the colony, Elixus, who greets the visitors. And it's very hard to assess (laughs) dispassionately, because you remember too well what a piece of work she turns out to be once you've seen it once. This bit really, really pisses me off because they're like, "Ah, oh, people," and so the young bloke asks about football, and the youngish woman asks about fashion. Yeah, that... fuck the fuck. <laughs> yep, fair enough. Can't disagree with that, really. Hmm. Interesting that the woman who makes reference to dresses is our only familiar face of this episode. No, I did recognise her. Yeah. She's Cassandra. She's played by Julia Nixon. She was in season one's The Arsenal of Freedom as an op in, but you're probably not remembering her from that because no. it's been so long since you've seen that. More likely, you're recognising her as one Catherine Sakai. Yes! Interplanetary yes, Indiana Jones. I am. And fiancé of Commander Sinclair of Babylon 5. Yes, I am. For the record, she was also in Rambo 2, Airwolf, and she played two different roles in Magnum P.I. Oh, wow. <laughs> She's a great actress, though. She, yeah. you know, she hasn't got a big role in this, but she plays it really well. Yeah. And the, the other thing, excuse me if I'm jumping ahead because I only made notes where something annoyed me. Um, <laughs> but she, Alexis goes on about them giving up technology, whatever, and then she says, we weave our own clothes. Yeah, you need a fucking loom to do that, you fucking cunt. So that's a piece of technology, isn't it? <laughs> Grow a fucking brain cell. You don't weave your own clothes using your fingers, do you? Ugh. Can you tell this? She is not my favourite person. I, I suspect that might be a running theme with, with lots of people, yes. <laughs> I mean, on the one hand, the fact this episode exists is something I like. Because all people who are like, let's get away from technology and leave London and go and live in the country with chickens are all fucking bonkers. <laughs> and this episode proves that. But it doesn't stop me wanting to kill people while I watch it. <laughs> Uh, Alexis thinks it's the local marshes that are behind the EM failures, but believes they have no need for technology now. Sandra asks if they will all leave when the rescuers come for Ben and Miles, but their leader declares that's something they will have to think about, but that she won't be going. See, initially, although she already seems a bit bonkers, she seems reasonable but bonkers, doesn't she? And this yes. Point, at this point... She's not saying, oh no, you can't possibly leave. She's saying, yeah, this is something we'll have to come to a decision to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she seems... But still manipulative, it has to be said. Yeah, but she seems not... How can I put it? She seems slightly unhinged, but not necessarily dangerous at this point. Uh As the officers are led off to help, she ominously remarks to Vinod, whom we learn is her son, that two more strong men would make a big difference to their community. Why doesn't she go and fucking breed something? Hmm. On Deep Space Nine, Kira and Dax are discussing a poker-playing admiral who is supposedly coming to brief them on Cardassian policy, but actually wants a rematch with Cisco with a gar game. They try without success to hail the Rio Grande. Ben and Miles discover books that have been modestly left by Elixus that she's written. She accuses the people of the Federation of becoming fat, lazy and dull. Now, Brian tells us Keiko accused him of being the same thing. 
And we're not surprised. Well, we, well, that happened, wasn't it? At the racquetball, didn't she actually say? That, well, not quite that bad. Not, no, no, not in many words, but that's why we can believe it. The writings make it clear that the primitive life of the colony is her idea of paradise. The community have someone dying from an infection caused by the bite of a local insect. Elixus doesn't approve the idea of attempting to access the runabout for its medical supplies. And when Cisco points out how stupid relying on the primitive medicine they have is, she calls him outside like a school teacher. Oh, I know. And why does he go? Why yeah. doesn't he just go? Why doesn't he just smack her in the face? Oh, no. Or just tell us to fuck off? Yeah. Or just leave? A running, or, again, you know. a running theme. Until the rescue party comes, she forbids him from mentioning them again and orders him to do things her way. His face is a picture of not wanting to take her shit, but for some reason he goes along with it. Yeah, and there's no explanation as to why. Yeah. She also advises him changing out of his uniform due to the heat, but you know from the look on his face that he's not going to be doing that in order to make a point at least. Back on the station, we hear that the Romulans have found the Rio Grande, travelling at warp 2 with no one on board. Kira and Dax leave for a runabout. Who's in charge of the station? Quark! Okay. <laughs> we don't see them pass on command, so maybe he is. The implication is it will take a while to track down their missing friends. Actually, wouldn't Julian be in charge? Uh, he's the command staff. He's, possibly, He's yes. a lieutenant, or is he yeah. a lieutenant commander? I'm not sure. Uh, he's a lieutenant. Working in the fields, we learn Cisco used to pick his father's vegetables for him because he was a chef, yes, we're told. Yes, this is the point. Ah, where... yes. At the risk of spoilers later on, we'll discover that isn't quite the case. So, yeah, whereas in the the other episode, the other Mm. episode, it was... the mention of his father's illness, but it's nothing beyond that. It could be read either way. This is past tense definite, Mm. and you have to... You find a way to make on it. It doesn't compute, basically. They witness an emaciated man being brought out of a metal box. Apparently it was punishment for stealing a candle, for which he spent a day in the box in the heat. Oh, it's just ridiculous. Cisco rightly accuses Elixus of practising torture. Miles tells his commander he gets the impression she expects them to stay for a while, and Cisco tells him to work on getting round the dampening field. Cassandra comes to Cisco at night, offering a massage. Ooh la la, they're getting married! Or not. Understandably, the commander goes to Elixus and accuses her of sending Cassandra to make love to him to encourage him to stay. Yeah. He points oh. out that she never had much use of technology and how fortunate she was to crash on a planet that fitted her philosophy of life so well. Yeah, mm. you can tell he's suspicious, but yeah. one of the things that really gets me in this scene when she comes it's not just the fact that Alexis has clearly sent Cassandra to be her whore, yeah. which, you know, obviously it is really annoying, but Cisco himself deals with that. Yeah. One of the things that Cisco doesn't deal with is the totally fucking creepy line Alexis doesn't believe in doors. Yeah. It's like, of all the things to not believe in, <laughs> doors? How can you not know that your leader, in inverted commas, is fucking bonkers mm. if she doesn't believe in doors? That's just wrong and broken and totally fucked up. And just to underline how fucked up she, she is, she gets all religious about their fate as if all, they were destined to end oh, up here. Yeah. yeah, well, you expect that, though. She's but just. She gets him to stand watch for the night. It's clearly... Well, she gets what? I mean, if this is an ideal planet, it's not going to have any fucking predators in it. There's no other people. What are they watching against? It's clearly a punishment for questioning him. And I'm amazed that Cisco puts up with it. It just doesn't make any sense at this point at all. Well, actually, that bit I don't have an issue with because he'll be used to the concept as a Starfleet officer of standing watch. But why would he obey her at this point? Because he doesn't yet have a sufficient reason not to obey and her request is not unreasonable made of a Starfleet officer. Well, considering what he's just discovered, it just seems he bloody odd. He hasn't got enough evidence yet to do anything. Mm. And standing you know, as a Starfleet officer, standing watch will be routine for him. Well, and the following morning, Miles tells Cisco that he suspects the genetic field isn't being produced naturally. Surprise, surprise. Cisco stupidly, and this is even, you know, if you, it was odd for me that he'd stand watch. He then agrees to do a shift in the fields, having stood watched all night. That's well. There's two and, and he's gi- he's given the option not to by Elixus, and then the only thing I can think is that macho. he's being a macho about yeah, this all, isn't he? I think he? It is, he's, he's, he's being trying to prove that he isn't weak in Federation, which is that. To, but unfortunately, no that point. that makes Cisco actually seem quite weak because yeah, he's, psychologically weak. Yeah, he might exactly. Be, might be proving his physical strength, but psychologically, yeah. that's that's the weak response. He's um, giving th- into a manipulation. Yeah, which is he is. Bad. And 
it's like it annoys me mm. it's like i can understand it that he's like no 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 you're trying to say i'm weak and whatever but actually the best response psychologically is to go oh yeah thanks very much yeah because she's lost then yep dax and kira in the orinoco wombles underground overground wombling free the wombles of wimbledon common are we making good use of the things that we find <laughs> oh, I had sorry tangent. I had to explain the Wombles to our kids because there was one in a museum. I won't bore you with why or what because actually there was no explanation. It was just there. And it didn't what fit. museum was this? A lifeboat museum had a Womble in it. <laughs> yeah, no, obviously, right? There was no explanation. Okay, there was random a life, Wombles. Yeah, totally. There was like, and it was all <laughs> about like lifeboats in history. So it wasn't even like, this is a lifeboat from when the Wombles was on telly. It was, this is a lifeboat from 1868 <laughs> with a Womble in it. Well, for, I don't know. But anyway, I saw this Womble and I've gone, oh, look, it's a Womble. And, and Leah's gone, a what now? And so I went, oh, right, TV programme, when I was a kid, um, they live on Wimbledon Common and collect litter and make stuff out of it. She looked at me and she went, why would you watch that? <laughs> <laughs> Good question. <laughs> and I was just like, oh, yeah. Well, the Orinoco has caught up with the Rio Grande, and Kira wants to beam over, but uh, the Trill advises against due to their being at warp. Yeah, well, warp, well, it's been referenced, I'm sure, in yeah, next gen that warp transports are it's very a bit risky. dodgy, yes, yes. You need, you need miles on hand to be able to let you do that. Dax instead is going to make use of a rope trick she learned from a Hopi, which apparently is a, a Native American. Who okay. Could, I, who, oh, I got that confused with the hoopoe. That's a bird. Who could do things with a rope the major wouldn't believe. For now. Oh. <laughs> Force fields are going to be used instead of ropes to slow the Rio Grande down to impulse, which is a nice bit of high-tech counterpoint with what's going on with the colony. It's a nice effect shot anyway, nice bumpy ride, and you've got the two uh, runabouts in front of each other. That's quite cool. Uh, back on the planet, Elixis announces that the sick woman from earlier on has died and then brings out a Brian under arrest for wasting time on finding a way to escape. Oh, and then Joseph says, maybe he's trying to get medicine. She's like, oh, yeah, that's the worst crime ever. He's just like, oh, fuck off and die in a bucket of wasps. Mm-hmm. Just fuck off, you fucking manipulative whore. Just die. And why don't... Why doesn't Cisco just punch her in the mouth with Flora? Well, unfortunately, at this point, she then has a knife at Miles's neck. And that's how she persuades him to go in the box. Uh, I mean, I can understand Cisco going in the box for miles. I don't have a problem with that. But mm. A, they could have just fucked off a lot sooner. Mm. B, they could have lamped her a lot sooner. Yeah, they should have, you know, twigged a lot earlier on that this woman was crazy and dangerous and they really don't want to be hanging around with them. I mean, they've got enough suspicions they voice themselves, so it yeah. just makes them out to be rather stupid. There's no sign of a struggle on the Rio Grande, but Dax discovers that someone tried to destroy the ship by flying it into a star, but it was deflected. Quite how Elixir's managed that without technology, we're not told, but there we are. They set off with the Orinoco on tow. A melted Cisco, still in his uniform, is brought to Elixir, who's denying him water, drinking in front of him like the evil git that she is. But it reminds me of the the torture scenes with the sandwich in Babylon 5. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is proper, full-on torture, isn't it? All the eggs, indeed, in... Chain of Command? Chain of Command, thank you. (laughs) It's, It's blatant torture. Yeah. Anyway, he... Demands that he changes out of his uniform before he has the water. And the thing and is, she, actually she says, then goes jo- away. She actually says, join us as well, which is like, yeah, okay. Join us. The thing is, she then goes away, right? So yeah. why doesn't he just drink the water? Yeah, because he's a Pratt, macho Pratt, who makes his way back to the box. Well, no, I can understand the psychology of making a point of going back to the box. That's how you defeat your torturer. I don't know. Cycle, or cycle. Now, again, that, that just shows he's complicit and has fallen under a spell. I mean, it's sad, isn't it? Yeah, OK. No, he should just drink the water. And... Yeah, and tell her to fuck off. And, yeah. That's what he should do, actually. But anyway, Miles tries to get Joseph on side, but when he refuses, he quietly asks permission to knock him out to protect him from Elixir. He's MacGyvered up a compass-like device to find the source of the dampening field and discovers a buried box of technology. Mm. Vinod starts firing arrows at him, so the chief has to run for it, using his shirt as a decoy and overcoming the young man, which is a nice bit of action scene. It's a reminder that the chief has combat skills. Yep. With his phaser now working, he breaks out Cisco and calls for Elixir. She admits to destroying the Rio. The other colonists now know the truth. 
She claims a lie can lead to a more important truth. No, fuck off. What kind of you idiot can't. believes that? Yeah, asking him to look at what they've learned about themselves and their achievements. Oh, it's all, just all oh. as a result of a lie. I mean, you know, like anybody's going to swallow that. I mean, it's not just that. She says, "Look at your achievements," and then she turns around and you would just have been repairman. No, he'd have been an engineer. He obviously yeah. liked being an engineer. Fuck off. Yeah. You'd have just been a clerk in an office. Well, I'm not being funny, but I, when I had a job as a clerk in an office, I liked it. I didn't have any particular desire to be outside when it was raining. <laughs> Fuck off. You know, offices can can be nice for some people. Now, okay, these people were already moving to settle. So you've got the extent to which she hasn't kidnapped a bunch of people. They're people who are already looking to settle on a new world. Fine. But they were looking to settle on a new world with technology and do stuff mm. that they had the necessary skills for. Not suddenly find the, find people in their community dying because that stupid fucking cunt wouldn't let them access modern medicine. But was quite happy for them to use a loom. Yep. Yes. And... All the way through this, she talks about man and his and all this fucking exclusive, yeah. fucking sexist, fucking language that, if anything, should tell the whole lot of them that this woman is just not to be trusted. She needs to be thrown in the bin or shot or killed or just maybe with a gag over her mouth so she can never talk again and her hands behind her back so she can't write any of her fucking propaganda. Yep. He points, Cisco points out there's been a cost in human lives for her theories and tells her that she'll have to answer for her actions. She says she did it all for the greater good. How can this be for the greater good? The greater good. Shut it! <sighs> Kira gets in touch, but when Miles invites the Collis to join them, Joseph says the planet is their home, and they have indeed formed a community there. Yes, a community formed on a lie, you idiot. And when he says none of us are leaving, he's just taken her place. Yeah. As the, the manipulative cunt. I mean, he hasn't asked anybody if they want to leave. And bear in mind that when they first turn up, it's Cassandra says, are we going to leave with you? Maybe Cassandra wants that job in an office where it doesn't fucking rain on her and maybe she doesn't get yep. bitten by killer fucking insects. Yep. He doesn't actually ask anyone at all. He just says, oh, we're happy here. No, you are fine. You stay, you come. Let whoever wants to go, go. You'll probably be on your own. <laughs> Thankfully, they do, do take the vile woman with them but there's an odd force shot with two kids standing side by side facing into the camera, which I really don't understand the significance of. Does that mean things are going to carry on? Does that mean they've all been brainwashed? I well, the only thing I think is that, well, for a start, I think, I'm not sure this is what it meant, but what I take from it is, bearing in mind there are children there who clearly have been abused, Cisco should be beaming them off. If he's going to beam the children off, he needs to find out who the parents are. Because they've been abused as well yep. and beam the parents off with them. So Cisco's wrong because he's leaving children behind. Also, I got the impression that the, the children were looking wistfully because they wanted to beam off. Nobody asked them what the fuck they thought. But then, you know, Cisco doesn't ask his son if he wants to be an engineer. So, you know. So this whole episode was written to give Cisco a personal challenge and also as a meditation on cults. It's supposed to make Cisco look strong. It doesn't. It makes him look like a fucking twat. <laughs> exactly. It does backfire horribly. It doesn't make any sense that he colludes until such no. time as Miles is threatened. Well, after that point, okay, fair it enough. It doesn't make sense then, but not yeah. before. Elixus is too much the pantomime villain to elicit any sympathy, although obviously a cult leader shouldn't elicit any sympathy. No. But this is kind of the whole point problem with the episode. It's like, you've how, how are you supposed to see the side of the cult followers i don't know it just seems completely stupid well no i think what you're supposed to do is, is the there's a few lines here and there that do make sense which is about how bear in mind the cult followers don't know that that duonetic or whatever it's called field is fo is false they think it's something about the environment that's done it okay if they think that the only way to survive is to build this new community, work the fields and all the rest of it. Bearing in mind, again, they were already looking for a planet to settle. That's not going to be, you know, totally against what they think. In other words, she's chosen a group of people that, in theory at least, it shouldn't be too difficult to convince to her way of life. Because already, for whatever reason, they want a new start. Hmm. So, in terms of the colonists' point of view, A, they always wanted to be colonists, just not without technology, and B, you do get it said a couple of times that it's about survival, and there had to come a point where they stopped trying to access the technology that they couldn't access, and instead concentrated on making a life for them where they were. Think of the inner light and Picard, and how 
in that episode, initially he resists, but there comes a point where it makes no sense to, and instead mm. he braces his new life. And I, that is the point of view, I think, that the colonists get across, is that th- there came a point for each of them where they lost hope. Mm. They didn't know that they could have been rescued if it wasn't mm. for a stupid technology. But, they I mean, having fa- having found out... Yeah, no, that makes no sense at all. Exactly. So, a, a, I mean, you can almost buy the colonists want to stay, except for the fact that they've now found out it was all built on a lie. And B, it makes no sense at all, Cisco and O'Brien colluding for as long as they do. No, that makes Knowing full well that something suspicious is going on in here, yeah. even if they don't know the full extent of it. It's just, yeah. No. Those two things, I agree with you, doesn't make sense. <sighs> right. <laughs> so, ultimately, it's a very annoying watch, I think it's fair to really, say. Really, really irritating. It's well acted. So, it, it scores over... Well, you say that. It is well Fucking acted. Alexis cunt woman. She's has well got acted. a very breathy, Shatner esque kind of performance. No, no, she's not Shatner esque, I wouldn't say no, that. No, but it's unnecessarily breathy and annoying. I think she's handed an impossible task, personally. I mean, it's, it's like, how are you supposed to give an extra dimension to this character that's like a two dimensional baddie, basically? She's this uh, twisted cult person. W- what hope is there for that role, really? Mm. Um, so, and I do, if. The original aim was to try and make Cisco seem strong. They failed. Totally. So ultimately, it's a failure of an episode. Yep. Fa la <laughs> But we've got over it. We've managed it. Shall we release the anger now? <laughs> I think I already did that. Oh, yes. From everybody else, though, I mean. Oh, right, yeah. No, they're perfectly entitled to their anger. Let's start this. with the Mark and see what he made of this one. And the Mark writes, Paradise or Boxing Clever or Stockholm Syndrome. Hmm. I am a science officer. It's my job to have a better idea. I love that line. So Cisco and O'Brien beam down and find a human colony that's been stranded ten years with no means of escape. The colonists have been forced to abandon all forms of technology, none of which work due to bizarre interference in the atmosphere, in what turns out to be more than a coincidence. So the leader considers her technology-free community a shining achievement, never mind that many of her followers have died as a result of living in such an extreme environment without modern medicine or supplies. Alexis has left several books she's written in both Cisco's and O'Brien's bunks. They are neither little nor red, proving she has some sense of subtlety. <laughs> Her methodology of torture in the face of any threat to the community's well-being, the simple and appropriate hot box, proves she'll do anything for her ideals. And again, why would anybody swallow that? I mean, oh. a, a smaller punishment maybe, but that's just so obvious, as Cisco points out, torture, that yeah. you, you've got to question the people who will put up with that. It's just madness. I mean, the thing is, if the crime that the guy who put in the box had committed was, like, murder... Yeah, that might have been a bit different then, again, but bearing stealing in mind, a candle... Yeah, hmm. I know. And the thing is, although it's still a hideous thing to do, even if it was murder, think about how many human beings in this day and age support capital punishment. You could see a community supporting that form of punishment for murder, mm-hmm. couldn't you? But not for stealing a fucking candle. Like it or not, Alexis is a villain, although a three-dimensional one surrounded by some utter dolts, willful torture of Starfleet officers by Federation citizens. Cisco climbing back into that box was a damn powerful moment, refusing to compromise his principles and bow to Alexis's will, except that he did bow to her will because he yeah, the box. Yeah, that's what she wanted. Just fucked off. She manipulated him to get him back into the box, and he fell for it. Hmm... Not good. No. Anyway, sorry. Why couldn't she have just found willing followers that wanted to live out her tech-free experiment? Yeah, good point. Why didn't she just ask for people to join? Yeah, her? yeah. I'm well, sure if, there would. If she'd been up from you know from the get-go and said you know come and live basic life, challenge yourself, but the fact is this whole thing is built on a deception. Yeah. So however they much they may have discovered about themselves, it's all built on a lie, and they know it now. So yeah. why are they still swallowing the shit? Oh. Uh. Culture shock, I suppose. Please see later on that horrid riser story. Oh, yeah, remember that. It's terrible. The lack of free will is her great crime, and yet the episode seems happy to pretty much ignore that and in the process make the followers seem even more marked dumb than they already do. Yep, good point. Yep. So the story raised a good issue, but oversimplified it by making the leader of the group a criminal Luddite and cult leader, (laughs) rather than showing a thoughtful community voluntarily issuing technology, both its detrimental and beneficial elements for the sake of another way of life on a new planet. This episode essentially plays with a common presumption of humanity that simpler times and the past are more preferable to the present. He posted on an internet forum to be read out on a podcast. <laughs> yeah, see, that's why I like the existence of this episode. 
because technology is neutral. Mm-hmm. Then anybody who just goes, oh, technology is all bad, is just bonkers. He says, I really hate this kind of puritanical garbage. Me too! I know the story showed the leader in an unsympathetical light. And I know other people on here have said how heavy-handed the storytelling is. But even if both those things have been remedied, I still don't think I can put up with this insistence that there's some kind of 18th century idyllic life to to which we should ultimately aspire. I agree. There isn't. Mm -hmm. It's fucking wrong. Also, they had tech, no power, but tech. They were not naked and shitting into leaves from caves. My point exactly. Completely agree with you. The final scene, however, is completely ludicrous and undoes everything the episode worked, episode worked towards. None of these people want to go back to their old life. No one has family or friends. No one has a career they want to revive. No one is pissed off that they've been lied to all this time. Um, <laughs> you pretty much quoted his next line. Oh, right, sorry. <laughs> 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 no, it's fine. It's fine. He agrees with us. His actual line was, no one's pissed off they were lied to by, for a decade by a psychopath. Yes, quite. No one wants the machines back on after the big reveal? I can't imagine 30 people would just stand there while she revealed she basically murdered their friends and family. It's a rare episode where the villain wins. I hated that smug superior victory smile on Alexis's face when she beamed up, and I was surprised the episode ended on that note. Hmm. But well, it didn't know. It's even weirder note to those two kids. <sighs> One last thing. That former engineer, whatever the heck his name is, well, must not have been very good at what he did. It took O'Brien, what, two days to figure out what the hell was truly causing the field? That yeah, but guy, O'Brien's MacGyver. <laughs> that guy had ten years. Worst <laughs> engineer ever. <laughs> yeah, I can't disagree with that. No, no, I think it's a fairest uh, description of it already. Yeah. Okay, we've also heard from Sampu. Oh yeah, here is some feedback for Paradise. Many people seem to hate this episode. I really don't know why, because I think it's pretty good. I look forward to this next podcast of interest. Oops. Oh dear. <laughs> the basic concept of the episode would make Rodenberry turn his grave. Federation citizen is so unhappy with the Federation, she decides to leave it entirely, take a large group of people with her. I think the episode proceeds quite nicely. First everything seems fine, and then like with any utopia cracks begin to show. One of the strengths of this episode is the character of Elixus. She is clearly a fanatic, although her full conviction only becomes clear as the episode moves on. She has a nice subtle charisma about her and I find it totally believable that people followed her. I think we can only agree to disagree on that yeah. one. There ain't nothing subtle about her. I also really like Cisco's performance in this episode, stubbornly refusing to give up. No cute women with massage oils will turn his head. O'Brien again shows that he also is an effective soldier in addition to being an engineer. Very true. Yeah. Dax wins the award for the most pointless allegory this week. There was no reason to talk about any old Earth rope tricks. All she had to say was, let's lock on with a tractor beam and slow to impulse. Yeah, but it's smut. Uh, (laughs) Dax did have an excellent line before that, though. I'm a science officer. It's my job to have a better idea. Yeah, that is a good line. Yeah. The ending did seem a bit odd first, the whole colony just unanimously deciding to stay, but on thinking about it some more, it started to make some sense. The life that they had lived in turned out to be based on a lie, and the leader they clearly trusted had been lying to them all the time, and Sisko just says, pack your bags, we're leaving, after they've had two minutes to think about it. Change like that needs some serious thinking and time, and now that the device is found, the colonists should be able to contact the world outside if they wish. So if some people decide to leave, it should be possible. And most likely some of the people will want to leave at some point. I think it was implied by the two children that the camera focused on at the end of the episode. They seemed very curious about the bigger world that they suddenly had access to. Ah, is that what that was supposed to be about? I I really couldn't tell. No, I couldn't get it from the episode, (laughs) but it would make sense if it was. So in the end, I really have no complaints about this episode. I'm really interested in hearing why some people seem to hate it. So until next time, live long and prosper. Well, hopefully we've kind of covered the reasons yeah, we're I think, yeah. annoyed. I say the, the the central thing for me is actually it doesn't make Cisco look strong. It no, makes it him look weak yep. because he's being macho throughout, and yep. it's that's playing right into our hands. Yeah, it's, it it's so frustrating because he's as you find out later on, he's far more clever than that. He's better yeah. than that. Yeah, he shouldn't have ro- risen to it. But hey ho. It's like when he slams that book, he says, oh, that's the first core behaviour I've seen. Hey, well, that is her cold psychology, but that should tell him that macho behaviour is playing into her hands. Yep. OK. Shall we release the brandy, then? Oh, yes, go on. <laughs> is it an email or an MP3? It's an MP3. Awesome. You may need to turn the volume down. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, orgs. 
You've been waiting for this for a long time, and now here it is. I've entitled this Paradise My Ass. I hate this episode with every fiber of my being. It makes me violently angry to the point where I almost didn't rewatch it for fear I'd be fuming for hours afterwards, and oh, did I fume. Now, not everything in this episode is terrible. Avery Brooks and Colmaney are, of course, doing it and doing it and doing it well. And I like their little talk about fatherhood in general, and even with the little teaser about how someone can find talents they never knew they had simply because they had no other choice. Now, in and of itself, this is not a bad philosophy. This is one of the most meat-fisted, punch-in-the-face ways of trying to justify that philosophy that I've ever seen. So let's talk about Gail Strickland as, um... Well, I can't remember her character's name, so I'll call her the bitch. I've seen her in other things. I don't remember her being so annoying, so why the fuck does she speak nearly every line as if she's about to burst into tears? It's not only annoying, it's distracting, and I wanted to punch her in the throat every time she opened her damn mouth. Okay, now the box. When we first see the box, a man's being helped out of it, and we find out he'd been put in there for stealing a candle. Back the fuck up. When Miles and Ben arrive at the commune, because that's what it fucking is, and the bitch is a cult leader, the bitch expounds on how they're all so close-knit and they all contribute, so everyone has to work for their supper. And then later she also says the box is the only punishment they have. They all agreed on it, because once you've been in the box, you never repeat your crime. So why does that guy need to steal a candle if they share everything? Or perhaps he shirked his work shift. But wouldn't that have put him in the box to begin with? Or, or, he's an incurable thief, as the bitch later infers in the show. But again, that would have landed him in the box! So his being in the box for sending a candle makes no fucking sense. Then there's the bitch sending what amounts to a prostitute to Cisco to use her feminine wiles to encourage him to what? Adapt to the situation? Get her pregnant so he'd feel a duty to stay? The bitch's explanation pisses Cisco the hell off, and so the racism begins. Okay, maybe it's not meant to be racism, but a white woman forcing a black man to stand watch and then work his shift in the field sounds like slavery to me. Of course, she tells him all he has to do is ask if he wants to not work his shift, but then what punishment would that action have held? Cisco stands firm, and when Miles is found wasting time, what the fuck ever, the bitch puts Cisco in the box. I hope I'm not the only one who found this trite and offensive, and even if the writers weren't thinking about a parallel to slavery, they sure as hell portrayed it that way. And there are other little things that niggle, like both Dax and Kira going off to fetch the Rio Grande. That's how it should be pronounced, Rio Grande. Who the hell is in command of DS9? They don't even talk to anyone before heading to a runabout. And then once they find the Rio Grande and lasso her to a stop, they both transport over? Surely with their skills they could each pilot a runabout, or had bouncing off a star made the Rio Grande inoperable? That's never really clarified. But now I'm going to talk about why this episode really pisses me off. The bitch is right? No! How does she know what all those people would have turned out to be if they hadn't crash-landed on the planet? Her theories were proved right, but under artificial circumstances created with lies and deceit. So are they really right? And the rest of the commune stays there, with Joseph actually saying that she was right? No! Pack up and leave! Don't let her have a fucking legacy! Go settle on some other planet if you want her. Go back to the Federation, but don't validate her actions! The end does not justify the means. She let people die when she had access to technology that could have saved them. She let them die to protect her lie and prove a point. That makes her a murderer to me. And what is her punishment? She has to leave the planet. That's the only consequence we get to see. Oh, and guess what? That commune was still using technology. No, they didn't have access to advanced technology, but what they had was technology that they created. They made tools and candles and fabric and built dwellings and so on. That's technology. The only things I liked, Ben not giving an inch, she would have rather died than let the bitch get her way, Miles making a crude compass from a hematite, a stone and a cup of water, Lassoing of the Rio Grande, which is also the name of one of the major U.S. rivers flowing from south-central Colorado to the Gulf of Mexico. Mexico abolished slavery in 1848. Isn't that interesting? All in all, this episode is horrible. I knew from the moment I saw the bitch that she was a liar and a cult leader and that their exile was created by her just to prove a point. People should never have to die just to prove a point. They should have put her and her son in the box and left the damn planet behind. That is all. Love the show. Thanks. Bye. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha!
was awesome. So, so from one extreme <laughs> to the other, <laughs> from Sampo to Brandy. I don't know. Well, the thing is, okay, bearing in mind this is a US program, mm-hmm. and Brandy's from the US. Mm-hmm. I hadn't picked up. I have to be honest. I hadn't picked up the slavery parallels. Yeah, there is that, but there's certainly there to be read, aren't they? They are there to be read. Now you've pointed them out, and mm. the thing is, this is a US program. So either they were put there deliberately, or they should have realised. Mm. Either way, whichever it is, they're fucking wrong. No, I hadn't. I hadn't seen the slavery mm. parallels myself. No. I, I ne- think that's possibly because we're looking at it from st- with Star Trek eyes where there is no racism. Yeah, I think that could that be That would it. be a nice way of thinking about it, wouldn't it? But, I mean, obviously looking at it with, you know, 21st century eyes, it's was dodgy, isn't 21st it? this 21st or 20th? Well, this was 20th, but yeah. no, now we're looking at 21st century eyes, aren't we? And it's still, yeah. let's face it, racism hasn't exactly gone away, has it? So. No, but, I mean, particularly, we were cross, weren't we, that Cisco didn't say, I don't want to do my shift. Mm-hmm. And what Brandy is saying is that he didn't have that option. Mm. He would have been punished if he'd stayed. Maybe, but I would have I would have preferred to have seen that. And it, uh, that sounds an awful thing to say, but you know, I would have preferred him to have made a stand and not done it, and then se- found then out. Then found they've, they've been consequences. Mm. No, that that I can understand. So that's bad writing. But then mm. that's one of Brandy's criticisms, isn't it? It's yeah. badly written. Also, she agrees with me about jail. Gail. Jail. I should have called. She should. That should be her name. Jail Strick- Strickland. No, Gail Strickland's delivery was annoying. Yep. Uh, I, I, but then again, I I think that's kind of she's supposed to be. I don't know. It's hard. It's hard to criticise her for playing for her performance of being a crazy cult leader when she's supposed to be playing a crazy cult leader. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. <laughs> no, that that that's that... kind of like criticising. I don't know. Christopher Lee for playing Dracula is slightly bloodthirsty. I mean, it's... <laughs> okay. Fair, yeah, I see what you mean. Fair enough. In terms of Rio Grande, Rio Grande, uh, you have the, the former. You're right. Is the correct pronunciation, but they always call it the Rio Grande on the show, hence just go to Rio Grande and hence I've always called it the Rio Grande as well, so the fault is with the with Deep Space Nine's actors rather than us I think you'll find on that one, hey maybe by the time they get to the future that they're, they're pronouncing it differently I don't know, but it does it, it is generally consistently called the Rio Grande so that's what we'll call it actually there is one other thing I want I, I wanted to say, which is don't validate her actions by saying she is a murderer Mm. Yeah. And no, I, there, there should have been at least some of those colonists that said, "Hang on a minute, all this has been built on a lie. We want out." I mean, okay, if some of them had stayed, fair enough. You're going to get some that decided that actually what they got out of the lie was somehow better, but not everybody, surely. No. Well, they weren't given a choice. Just, Joseph just said. Well, um, yeah, yeah, but you've got to realise that's shorthand because they, they can't have them all having a speaking role. But ultimately... No, does... Cassandra has a speaking role. Yeah, she, she, she could... Something. And you would have expected her to as well. I mean, yeah. she, at the start, she's really keen about the idea of being rescued, isn't she? Yeah. So really, they should have had her say, oh, no, fuck this, I'm going... I'm <laughs> yeah. getting out of here. Yeah. Yeah. And she is a murderer, mm. and they shouldn't have just gone, oh, we'll beam you up. They should have actually made that explicit. You are now going to be tried for murder. Mm-hmm. And, and then maybe... As Sampo was saying, then leave the colonists who do now have access to the outside world to make their own decisions. Yeah. But I do think it needs to be said out loud to the colonists, you're now going to be tried for murder. But all of them? No, to the Alexis. Say out loud to the colonists, Alexis, you're Uh now going to be tried for murder. So they they are left under no illusion, if that makes sense. And then... Because I think Sampo is right in the sense that we don't know what decisions the colonists made ultimately. Mm. It's not necessarily the case that they did, well, Joseph obviously tried to speak for them all, but some of them with that access to the outside could have then said, I want to leave. Yep. But I do think it needed saying in front mm. of them, you're going to be tried for murder. So as I say, we, we, we've we, quite quite an extreme <laughs> variation of reactions there. Yeah. And Brandy and Dave uh, record the Dark, Dark Corner. Corner. That's what the Inside Out cast has now become. Uh, and that's available on iTunes. Let's find out what the Argyle Smurf thinks of it. Salutations, dearest dogs, and indeed everybody else. This is Damien the Argyle Smurf, and I have once again forgotten to do my homework until the morning of the uh, of the class. So I'm um, sorry about this if this seems a bit rushed. Um, this is my review of Star Trek Interaction. Or is it Star Trek Bridge on the River Kwai? Or um, whatever that one with Morabok was. I can't remember. But, um, yeah, that. Might have dropped in a hint there. I wasn't a great fan of this. Um, It's not intrinsically bad. 
you know, it's moderately well acted. It's, you know, it's just a shame that it's a horrible, horrible trope. Um, I've, I've seen this story so many times, I'm very bored by it. So, um, so there it is. Um, so yeah, we start with Station Log, because everyone loves one of those. Um, and a conversation about baseball. So I'm very sure that, that uh, for the first 30 seconds or so, you were loving this episode, guys. Um, we do get a set like free reference, which I don't think it was the first one, but it's always good to have that continuity, I guess. And we have a duonetic field, which at no point do they ever try and reverse the polarity of its neutron and what's it. Um, and yes, so, and then, you know, as soon as they're on the planet, you do sort of smell that this might just be obviously this came before Star Trek Interactions that's slightly harsh but I'm I'm certain we've seen this story before um and even when O'Brien is baffled by the idea of people not wanting to leave their home really I mean come on have we not done that enough times already Morabok remember him he didn't want to leave his home either and that was about to get blown up so um anyway but hey we have Catherine Sakai so that's a win um Julia Nixon, for those of you who don't Babylon 5. Um, also, I found out when Googling her, not, not a euphemism, that um, but she married David Soule, Starsky or Hutch. Forget which one's which. I thought that's amazing. I didn't know that. Um, but, um, but yeah, anyway. You know, that's one of the few upsides. Another upside for me personally, which I'm sure none of you will have, well, very few of you will have, references to poker, baseball, and soccer... And, you know, I'm quite happy with all of that, because, you know, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a sports nerd as well as a real nerd. Um, but, yeah, apart from that, 10 minutes, 45 seconds is the moment at which I knew where it was going. And, no, I don't remember the episode in the slightest. So, um, it was a long half hour after that, I'm afraid. Um, I did pick up a few interesting points. Um, I find it interesting that um, Redhead Shrew, or Alexis Sanchez, or whatever you want to call her, refers to mankind rather than humanity. And refers to mankind using the best resources he has. It's interesting that they focused on the male pronouns, even though it's a woman leading the camp. I would have expected a humanity using the best resources they have, or the best resources at their disposal, rather than defaulting to the male pronoun. Surprised me that did. Maybe it's a 90s thing, I don't know. Um, not so sure about either the uh, Romulans spotting the runabout travelling at warp 2, but knowing enough about it to know that it's empty and being able to read its markings. Hmm, not so sure about that. Um, Catherine Sakai gets um, pimped out by uh, Alexis Sanchez and um, and Cisco sees through it rather than just going for it because yeah, it'd be tempting. He is single. I'd be tempted if I was single. Um, sorry, no, behave. Um, but um, goes in, tells, tells her exactly what he thinks of her. Um, Alexis, that is, not the other one. Um, and, you know, I think you're contemptible. It's a good line. Like that. Good put down. But then he agrees to do the work and stand the watch. Why Why has he done that? Why not just say, fuck off, bitch, and go back to bed? I don't know why he does that, but there it is. Um, then, you, then we can all sing Cisco in a box. Cisco in a plastic box. Um, the argument between Dax and Kira about um, the rope trick. Bullshit, by the way. No, not having that. Um, that's a dodgy argument. Because the ranking officer should realise that the rope trick risks two lives and the beaming across risks one, and should go for that. That might just be me. Um, I think that's about all I got out of this episode, I'm afraid. Um, oh, no one, no one reacted aggressively. No one tried to beat her to death once she, um, what once she, re- once it was revealed that she was a murderer. No, not one person came running forward screaming and shouting about how that was my wife, husband, boyfriend, girlfriend, who died and tries to kill her. That surprises me. I would I would have expected at least one massively aggressive reaction to what had happened, unless they did all have a suspicion that it was going on. Um, but yeah, apart from that, nope. Sorry, didn't enjoy this one at all. I mean, it was very easy. It was badly paced. It was very easy to see where it was going for me. Um, and that was the problem, which is the exact opposite of what the last one had, where it was very well paced and everything was revealed at exactly the right moment. It was too obvious, too early, what was going on here, and it just made it boring. Um, I don't know if this is going to clash with everybody else's opinion, because that's happened a few times before, but we'll see. Um, apart from that, since everyone will have done the um, Cisco in a plastic box thing, um, I'm going to put in a different song. I'm going to go with, they've got two tickets to parrot. I'm not going to do that anymore, sorry. I'll go away. 
I apologise. I'll try next time to be on time too. Um, have a good podcast, guys. Thank you very much, and speak to you soon. Cheerio. Bye. Bye. I believe it's Hutch that David Soul played. Oh, I right. just Googled it. <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen Starsky and Hutch. I'm afraid. Yeah, so that's a good, there's a confession. Gosh. Blimey, Charlie. There you are. Oh, we need to get that on DVD. <laughs> Possibly. I don't know. Uh, he, interesting, he picked up on the pronouns as well. Yeah. Mm, another reason to get annoyed. Uh, and the insurrection connection. Now, I'm not. The insurrection connection? That sounds quite poetic. It does. Um, I'm not sure whether that works. I mean, I, I can see where he's coming from with that because they've got a society that's supposed to be, you know, doesn't have advanced tech and oh, stuff. Yeah. But the difference with them is that they've got this literally ideal society where none of them age or get sick or anything that they're going to be worried about on this particular planet in Deep Space yeah. Nine. So it's not really comparable, is it? Because no. What you know, do you need the technology for? Exactly. They're, they've they've discovered a place where... Li- technology is redundant yep. rather than they're choosing not to use it even though it could save Set lives. aside technology and... Uh, yeah, exactly. So they will. Hmm. Um, couple of things... Good point about the Romulans not just seeing the runabout, but recognising its markings and knowing there's nobody in it, as opposed to nobody was yes. coming from Hales. That's uh, a cause uh, for uh, concern. Recognising the markings, if they've got good spies, and we know that the Romulans are pretty good on the spying front, uh, that I can accept. But knowing that there's nobody on board, I guess they've scanned it, but mm, interesting, yeah. But it should be a cause for concern, though, shouldn't it? Oh, yes, definitely, they should be worried. Yeah. <laughs> And, and also the fact that presumably they're going to have to chase into Romulan space to go after it, but that's never mentioned, is it? No. The The other point I want to pick up on, because it's a good point, is it, it's very difficult to believe there is not one aggressive reaction mm-hmm. to to what Yeah, exactly. I mean, that, if only it was Cassandra or, you know, or another colonist, but I mean, it may as well have been Cassandra since she had a speaking role yeah. and said, no, hang on, I'm not putting up with... Yeah. It would have been a lot more acceptable. The fact been. that all of them go along is like... Uh, uh, As there actually would have been much more believable if there was, say, one aggressive reaction, and then the rest decided to stay or something. It, it would have changed it, you know. Mm. Okay, well, thank you for that, sir. And, and don't thank worry you. about getting the homework in late. Homework, horrible word. Um, <laughs> yeah, let's find out what Drew and Tracy made of this one. So this episode was basically about some evil, sadistic woman who purposely crashed. A spacecraft yep. onto that planet that she'd sourced, which would um, and set up the the duonic field yeah. thing to stop them all. Yeah, we, it's like the village, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it was a village. village. We knew yeah. the plot yes. was actually gonna, you know, we knew what was gonna happen in this episode. I but think it was obvious what was going on. It yes. still didn't make me feel any less mad. I know. I've got to say, I can't think of an episode of Star Trek that's ever got the blood pumping no. as much as this, this one. This episode absolutely made really, me furious. It's if I could have feathers. got into that screen and punched that woman right in her I know. face. Especially I... when she put bloody Cisco in, <clears throat> in the <clears throat> stillage. Oh my well, God. Well, let's go through some points. Yeah, I first of all, I wrote Alexis is a baddie and then I crossed it out and put dominating bitch. Yeah. And then I was about to cross it out and put worse than Hitler, to be honest. Well... Because she... Oh, she's just terrible. Yeah, my, my word for her was just ever. bully, absolute bully. I know, I know. Just, yeah, Cisco in the stillage, I don't understand why he was obeying her. Why, why like, when he went in it and then when she came and said, you can have the water if you get changed, why why wasn't he just saying, I'm not going to go along with you? Do you understand that? No, I don't. And at first I thought, oh, well, he's not going to be dominated by her. But actually, he should have just... T- when she left the water and the clothes, he should have said, right, fuck you, I'm going to drink this yeah, water why, and you can screw your clothes. Water? Exactly. I don't know. And, and when they first showed you the silly and it was, you know, that, that Stephen was in there, it just made me even more mad with this episode because you're thinking, if you're so happy and you love everybody and everyone's all sharing, caring... Why did you feel the need to steal in the first place? Yeah, I guess so. She she was just such a horrible, dominating person. A, a little, a few bits in this episode, I just found it hard to believe. Like, the first one is that she could continually... I can't remember how long they said they was there, five years or no, something? No, ten years. Well, whatever ten it was. Years. I just think that after a while, people would go, look, I'm, I'm, this is just ridiculous. She is completely dominating it. I mean, I guess she's a really forceful person, and I guess even if they are really kind of submissive people, at some point, it would be just like, she's completely like, she's a dictator of the community. Well, she, yeah, she, yeah, because the thing is, at the end of the day, she's kind of taken them to this, this planet, planet, and she's basically said, well, there's absolutely no way you can ever get off this, you need to make the best of what you can, 
So you need to do this and you need to do that and we're going to make you happy. So not being funny, after 10 years, people don't really know any different. I think at some point, just the whole community would go, we've had enough of this. Yeah, but would they? But what her point at the end was, you know, we can go back to civilization, but but you're going to be like a little skivvy. But here, you're you're, you're kind of your own man. So I can kind of see that she's doing it for them. That that was the second bit. But just the way she's done it is just absolute bullish. That was the second bit that I found a little bit unbelievable at the end when, like, it was all a lie on her. And then they and that Joe says, oh, no, actually, we're going to stay here. You'd be like, hold on. On a minute, so it was all a lie. I tell you what, as well, when Miles turned the thing off and he went in there, if that was me, I'm sorry, you know, I don't believe in capital punishment, but I would have instantly disintegrated her. <laughs> I would have been like judge, <laughs> dread, jury, and executioner. I would have just been like, she's gone, that's it, it's gone, harsh, it's gone. Right? But you know what I mean? I and get your Cisco, point. like, oh, you're gonna have to answer for your crimes, yeah, right now. Yeah. But going oh. back to it, they didn't want to leave because she's saying to him, you can leave, but you're going no. to go back to being someone who's sweeping the floor. Uh, it's about how you take manipulation, isn't it? They wouldn't sweep the floor. So you can even But that's have... what she's saying they would be. No, it wouldn't because Star Trek is a utopia, you know? It's all stuff is good. Everyone, There's no money. Everyone works for the Yeah, but not everyone's captain and, that. and, and yeah, but... stuff like that. People have to start at the bottom ranks, you know? Perhaps in... Clean, in like... Someone cleans the toilets on, on yes. Deep Space Nine. And they've probably got robots to do <laughs> And i tell you what as well, when she was giving the speech at the end about um, potential of man and all that lot, mm. and she was in it with a smile, she's a real psychopath. This episode annoyed me. It really annoyed me. I wanted Cisco to punch her in the face. I, I wanted it was annoying, O'Brien to but... punch her in the face. I wanted to punch her in the face. Annoyingly yeah. good, I'd say. Yeah, because the thing is, though, you knew exactly what was going to happen. From I know. The minute it started. It was obvious. When it came up Annoying. and it said paradise, you thought, yeah, here we go. It's like the village, isn't it? Um, Annoying, but good. Yeah. And and then another. I'd rather watch an episode that gets your blood pumping yeah. than just a boring one. And nice to see. This is about the third episode in a row where it's been O'Brien heavy. Yeah. So, Excellent. yeah, good on. Number Marvelous. one. Let's have it. Thank okay. you very much. Bye. 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 Can't say I enjoy having my blood pumping as much as this episode makes, no. to be honest. It's not an enjoyable watch for me, but there you go. No, it, it's not enjoyable at all. I'm with Drew, disintegrator. <laughs> but I, I always assume the toilets are self-cleaning. <laughs> yes, I think they must be somehow in the future. Okay, let's find out what Purry makes this one. Hello again, Purry here to talk about Paradise. Um, I was interested to watch this one because all I remember from it was some form of community with a farm and a Cisco in a box. So I was actually interested to see this one, particularly since I heard, I believe, I think this is the one that Brandy said she had a top class rant uh, saving up for, so I do look forward to that. And I'm sure I've heard at least one other person, and forgive, uh, obviously apologies if it's not Brandy having the rant, but just generally forgive me whoever... um, did have the a similar problem with this episode and I've forgotten who it was but I have heard people complain about this episode and since it never really stuck in my mind I was wondering what it actually was that uh, drove people nuts. Um, now in this episode I'm going to say a few of the good things about it because um, I found it meh more than anything else uh, so like I say I am wondering if I'm missing something I am quite often miss out uh, things that are subtle or quite often things that are blindingly obvious so uh, I'm going to go over the things I liked about it um, I do like Cisco's glower Cisco's glower is awesome he can glower things to death and uh, indeed I, I do feel the crazy cult leader was uh, probably quite lucky or quite unlucky rather that Cisco landed on her planet because uh, yeah he wasn't going to quit he wasn't going to negotiate he was going to stare glare at that box until his eye burned a hole through the side and something like O'Brien gets uh, some nice again some nice little bits of character framing we find out he wasn't actually that good at his test there's um, some suggestions of Jake getting some extra Starfleet training and um, we have uh, O'Brien obviously being the techie genius that he is, MacGyvering together a compass. Uh, and you know, there was, I, I think, those two characters got. We also get some really good Kira and Dax stuff, and we haven't seen that since um, the Circle trilogy of episodes, which is uh, a real shame, because I thought that worked really well, and I'm glad, considering they revisited the O'Brien Bashir stuff, um, I'm glad they have also revisited some of the Kira um, and... Um, 
Dax stuff, right? Did I say Kieran O'Brien? Kieran Dax stuff. Um, I did like the comb. I mean, again, it is very much Dax kind of playing the Joker to Kira's uh, straight man, but uh, I think it works really well, and I can't remember if we get much more of that, which is a shame. Um, but the episode itself, uh, well... If nothing else, it's guilty of being blindingly obvious. Uh, now, yes, I had seen it before, although, like I say, I only remember Cisco in a box. Um, and, in fact, I actually remembered the, the nutter in charge of the colony as male, so that gives you an idea of how do- dotty my memory was. But, needless to say, the minute we meet her, we know she's a wrong Um She's got that slightly empty, maniacal grin uh, on her face, and I do feel for it, because I think that is just the actress's face. Uh, but she does have that real look of um, a, a mad zealot. And indeed, she is. She's written books and books about how technology makes us weak. It doesn't. Wi-Fi makes me stronger. I have no evidence to back this up. But hell, no one who says that technology is making us fat and lazy has much ev- evidence to back us up. Free time makes us fat and lazy. Maybe the technology giving us that. Who knows? That's a rant for another day. But yes, it's a tedious anti-technology cult. They must exist, but apparently this woman couldn't, in an age where you could presumably find it, well, at the moment, if I went onto the internet and decided I wanted to hook up with a whole of uh, grown men who like My Little Pony, I could quite happily do it. Um, I refuse to believe that in the future you couldn't find, like, 40 or 50 people who wanted to live in an anti-technology world. But no, instead, our resident nutcase decides she wants to run her own community and has to fool hold people into it. And again, my kind of annoyance is that I'd have, I thought briefly we were going to get kind of a more Deep Space nine ending. Instead, we got something very next-gen where they say, no, but this is our home and we've formed a better community and we like it now. Uh, whereas, you know, just uh, what, literally a couple of days earlier, they were just about to bite Cisco's arm off for a trip home. Um, and I think that's kind of where my problem came with it, was that they all suddenly go, yeah, but she was kind of right. I know she fooled us into this and stranded us for ten years on a planet farming and being stuck in boxes uh, but you know what, it's not all that bad um, you know, me, I'd be running home for my replicators and holodex but that could be me, even after 10 years I want some conditioned air and some processed food, please God give me e-numbers, and I think this is, like I say, that's my main problem, that weird shot at the end with the two kids staring at the box um, in fact, to be honest, if I was O'Brien, I'd have probably vaporised the box just out of, you know, just to be sure uh, maybe Cisco did that and the other gripe I have is um, I was hoping we'd get a few extra levers, and that's another problem I had, that they basically say, anyone want to go? And uh, that other bloke goes, um, no, no, we are going to stay here and form a community, and I wanted at least one person to come out and say, okay, they wouldn't actually say, but, you know, come out and say basically, bugger this, no, I'm going back to Starfleet, thank you, bye everyone. Um, but no, we didn't, we get everyone staying and having a community, or at least everyone looks like they're staying, it's not like they give them a chance. Were they in a hurry? They could have hung around for a couple of days. But no. So, uh, yeah, like I say, the episode itself was a bit meh to me, but I am interested to find out what uh, engages so much ire, because I just found it below par and a bit weird. Um, but uh, hopefully we'll have a better crop of episodes uh, for next time. Until then, do keep up the good work. Sorry, I'm very much over time. Um, it's a very good podcast, and um, just keep it up. Uh, I do enjoy listening to it. Anyway, bye for now. Bye! Bye! Wi-Fi makes me strong. <laughs> yeah. Uh, O'Brien the MacGyver, he picked up on that as yeah. well. <laughs> it's interesting that you remembered Alexis as male, mm. quite possibly because of the sexist language, talking about man and his. Mm. And also the Cisco Glower, which is very good, yeah. but he, unfortunately that that's the limit of his, his resistance, which is not so good. No. And in the fact that nobody at the end goes, hang on a bit, bugger for this for a game of shoulder, soldiers, I can go back to Federation. Which, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, madness madness and yeah it's bloody obvious but I agree the Kira and Dax stuff is nice yep yep that is good stuff O'Brien's good in it as well yeah okay well glad we got that one out of the way <laughs> yeah. oh, do tell me we've got better stuff next time well we're recording on Thursday the 17th of September and we shall be covering the Deep Space Nine story Shadow Play Okay, I don't know what that is. Well, apparently it has Odo and Dax investigating disappearing colonists, but I re- all I remember about this is it's got a child that Odo makes friends with, which, let's face it, happens a bit, so... Yeah. Doesn't narrow it down. No. And the Next Generation episode, which I've only got vague memories of, Eye of the Beholder, in which the Enterprise is haunted. Woo! Yes. It's not the Granny Shagger, is it? No, we're not back to that, thankfully. No, okay. we've got we've got some Rosa behind us. Cool. 
<laughs> so I don't know about that either. No? I remember nothing about either of them. Ah, excellent. Blank slate. Splendid. <laughs> Thank you for your contributions, folks. Thank Much you. appreciated. We'll catch you next time. Cheery bye. Bye. The broadcast is brought to you by the lovely people at geekplanetonline.com. Music at the beginning of this podcast was written and performed by Adam Buxton and is used with his kind permission. All music referenced is for illustrative purposes only and no copyright infringement is intended. To contact us, you can use the forums at geekplanetonline.com. Visit our Tumblr site at broadcast.tumblr.com where you'll find images accompanying the episodes discussed in this cast. Send email messages or MP3s to broadcast at geekplanetonline.com. Or you can contact us via Twitter on rev underscore org or broadcast ammo. Hashtag broadcast. Shut it down!